All right. Well, we're going to start off with the Giants. The Giants uh, were one of the, I think, three teams that you heard me year in, year out say, I don't believe it. They got to prove it to me. I don't believe it. They got to prove it to me. I think it was them, the Jets and the Jaguars that I was famously on uh, soapboxes about for so long. Well, I mean, you know, after starting out, kind of looking the way you expect the Giants to always look, they actually finished really strong. And then by the time they found themselves in the playoffs, that's right. I said in the playoffs. Um, yeah. And, you know, there was even buzz where they're like, oh, maybe they'll knock off the Eagles. They did not. It came crashing down to earth and they got absolutely decimated in that game. But I would still say at that point they were kind of playing with house money. They got a lot further than uh, certainly than I thought they'd get. And I would say by most honest people's assessment, uh, you'd have to call that year a big success for the Giants. So coming back strong into the 2023 season, tell me about the Giants and their fantasy prospects, Wolf. Yeah, absolutely. A shocking turnaround for them under Brian, Brian Dayball. Huge fan of the guy. And I expect whether or not the record shakes out to reflect a huge jump forward, at least offensively, despite the big jump they already took, I think another one is in store this year. And you'll see in the projections, I'm very high on a lot of these guys, especially. I've been on record saying how much I love Daniel Jones. And then after statting him out, did nothing but confirm my love for him. So we'll dive into it. I do think we're going to see another spike in his production, and then it trickles down to everybody else. But starting at the team level, I do expect a jump in total volume as well as pass plays. Brian Dayball, historically, when he was with Buffalo, was about a 59 to 41% pass-to-run ratio, so much more pass-happy, always around 60 to 80 plays above the league average. Last year was above the league average, but we saw a much closer 51% pass pass 49 percent run and that was about the midway point of the year week seven or so when they finally started to uncork daniel jones he started to average around 32 pass attempts per game and i think that's going to take yet another spike forward one just because of second year in the system they now know they want to commit to daniel jones rather than figuring out is this our guy of the future or what what are we going to be what's our identity is it saquon is it daniel jones what's it going to be we do think they committed, you know, clearly they committed, they gave all the big money to Daniel Jones, so now they have that in place. They have a second year of him learning the system, but even more so, the fact that they've added Darren Waller, Paris Campbell, Jalen Hyatt through the draft, just weapons all over, bringing back Darius Slayton and Isaiah Hodgins, who had great years for them as well. So between the weapons upgrades, second year in the system, and there's Daniel Jones being fully committed to, I think we're going to get a higher pass volume overall, so a big jump, about 60 to 50 uh, pass attempts going all the way up to 624. That'd be a little bit less than what we saw with Josh Allen, Brian Dayball connection there. And I think that's fair. It's Josh Allen versus Daniel Jones. It's still definitely a big step above him, but a big spike nonetheless in Daniel Jones attempts with the rushing volume coming down just slightly. And now we get a, a little bit of a 56% pass, 44% run ratio. That seems about right. It's like that happy medium between the Giants we saw last year, the Bills we've seen in the past of Brian Dayball. That felt like a pretty good pie distribution to me. So with that big jump in volume, obviously production should and I think will happen for Daniel Jones. As you can see here, 4,600 yards, 33 touchdowns. Both of those would be career highs by a mile for Daniel Jones. And I don't think that's a stretch at all, given his second year within a the first really competent offense he's ever been in. So big spikes for him. Those are really big spikes. So maybe I'm a little too high compared to the general consensus, but it, this is hinging on them really getting into a much pass happier offense there. Uh, big spikes there. The thing with Daniel Jones that you love to see over a, you know 120 rush attempts last year, over 700 yards on the ground with Brian uh, Dayball. In fact, I actually am going to take these ints down a little bit because he really cut down the interception ratio. He was the only runner to have quarterback rather to have over 700 rush yards and under 10 interceptions. So with him airing it out a little bit more, I do think maybe he does get into double digit interceptions, but still keeps those relatively low with that improved decision making. And then right around six to seven touchdowns, what we saw last year, sneaky Konami upside to Daniel Jones, his teammates called him vanilla Vic all last year. And he's averaged 6.5 yards a pop across his last three seasons. So 5.7 would be a little bit of a down step too. So this might be a conservative rushing ceiling that we're projecting here. And uh, uh, the, that kind of balances out the big pass ceiling. I see him reaching to balance out, you know, maybe a little bit less rushing upside since they're strong more this season. But either way, however you want to slice that, he'll run 5,200 total yards, around 40 total touchdowns for Daniel Jones. That would be a monster season. And where he's going right now and round 10 or so, 
makes would make him the ultimate steal in fantasy drafts. I feel really good about it, Truth. Do you think I'm nuts for my Daniel Jones love this year? Uh no, I I actually really like him too, but I there's I if so I know that your projections certainly are not like the line that DraftKings or anything like that is going to give out. But if they were giving out 4,600 yards and 33 passing touchdowns, I'd be slamming the under like a motherfucker. <laughs> like, I mean, if Daniel Jones, like, averages over his career, like, 2,900 yards, maybe something like that for a season. I know we're talking about big changes. You're talking about, like, over 50%, like – uh, upping his his stuff. I mean, he had 15 touchdowns. Actually, you know, and you gave the stat about the rushing, uh, t- the the the, t- the rushing yards uh, and the interceptions. I mean, it's actually even better than you said. You're like, oh, he had 700 yards and less than 10 picks. I mean, he had five picks. Like the guy wow. was very, he was very efficient with the ball. He was not even close to 10 picks. Um, and so he has improved as a passer, but you're projecting such massive gains. I would I would definitely be hitting the under on that. Like even if you think he's going to improve a ton, um, you, he could improve a ton and not approach those numbers. Is what I'm saying. Absolutely, I, I do think it's a combination. You need a lot of things to go right for that projection to hit. I 100% agree, and I will probably look heavily into what his projection is because I imagine Vegas is sending it right around 4,000. As you said, he's never been above his his career high is 3,200, which was last year his first in a competent offense. I am projecting just a huge spike in overall volume to facilitate that in in terms of Brian Dayball getting back to what he typically did with Buffalo. And maybe he doesn't. Maybe he keeps it at a 51 to 49%. And then in which case, this would definitely smash under. Uh, But the the jump in touchdowns, the jump in yards also has a lot to do with him throwing to actual NFL receivers and talent uh, this year as well. The fact that Richie James was their leading receiver and target share last year tells you all you need to know what he was thrown to and that he was still getting it done, at least fantasy wise, uh, tells you, tells me everything I need to know. So yeah, you're right. This would be a 1400 yard jump. That's huge. And probably a little too much. So something I will need to to check and see, Uh, but I I don't know. I I do think Brian Dable, just given what we've seen between him and Josh Allen, yes, big talent gap between Daniel Jones and Josh Allen. I'm not saying they're similar, but I, I do think with the increased weaponry, for Daniel Jones to close that gap between him and Josh Allen even halfway could mean a ginormous spike in overall production. Um, even if he even just gets to 4K and 28 four, touchdowns, that would be four, a yeah, huge that's, that's kind of more where I am. That, I'm, I'm yeah. more in that range, which, like, you know, I even feel a little bit like, wow, man, that that would be an unprecedented season for this guy, especially if, if he's still around 700 yards rushing or even in that vicinity. Um mm-hmm. Uh, don't don't let me be a wet blanket here. Like you know, you're not me. a wet blanket. It's, it's a good. You're the truth for a reason. We call you the truth. <laughs> you're throwing a little truth on this. Uh, it was definitely an aggressive spike to reflect my love for Daniel Jones and this offense as a whole. Probably a little bit too much, but you know, a happy meet him. Even if he got to that, just four K and you know, twenty eight touchdowns, still in round ten, given the rushing oh, yeah, production that we're seeing there, that no would question. be a really really nice pick. Yes, yeah, so. Either way, I'll probably taper these back a little bit for everyone out there. I do think it might be a little high, but I, they talked so much about how they're pr- prioritizing. You know, he had a, a decent year last year, and they were dead last in terms of uh, big plays. It tied with the Rams last year with plays that only 16 pass plays own for 25 yards or more. They go and then target as many speed guys as they can. Paris Campbell, a 4-3-40. Jalen Hyatt. Four three, uh, you know they they bring back Darius Slayton who runs a sub four four there, and they'd already talked about your Brian Dayball and Slayton had a great quote. What's the point of having Ferraris to leave them in the garage? So all practices, all early OTAs, he's finding these mismatches. He's making sure to hit them deep. It is of course, as we say on all these shows, padless practices, shorts. I get that, but they're they're talking a ton about how with Darren Waller over the middle right now, it's opening up so much underneath to have that type of weapon, and so. So, you know, when you have this speed, you have those mismatches, I think a humongous spike. And again, I, I can tell now a humongous spike could be just getting to 4K yards and 28 touchdowns. Not well, that, is a humongous, that is a humongous spike. It really is like that. 
you know, you it, it's a bit, it, it'd be much. almost an unprecedented spike. So as much as I like Daniel Jones, I will taper these back a little bit. So take the rest of these with a grain of salt. But when I go through these weapons, truth, you're going to kind of, like, uh, it's going to be, okay, so who's the one that gets dinged? Or is it just an overall volume thing and 624 pass attempts is too much. And, and they're more so going to be at 570 and everybody's kind of gets taken down. So let's see, you know, when I break down these shares, what's, if any of them really okay. stand out to you as, as not, uh, in line with what could happen here. So I have ultimately a uh, 15% share in terms of the, we're, we'll talk about strictly the passing game right now, and then we can get to Saquon because that's a lot easier to project. The guy's a monster. Uh, but I think about 15% of targets, right? What we saw last year, Saquon, uh, so right around 94 with that big spike in looks, I could see that being realistic for him. And then after that, it's, it's really tricky because I think all these receivers are all pretty similar in terms of how I expect them to go. You know, 14% to Darius Slayton, 15% to Hodge, and 17% going to Paris Campbell. That obviously means I think he wins that slot role, which I think is the most solid receiving role in this offense. Richie James averaged the highest target share last year as the slot guy for really only half the year before Sterling Shepard got hurt and then Wandale Robinson. But Shepard was looking really solid, then Wandale looked good, and then it was Richie James the rest of the year. So, Whoever ends up being the slot, and right now Paris Campbell seems like the early favorite, very active in OTAs. Uh, the, the beat writer saying they expect him to lead this team in wide receiver catches, but then those beat reports also suggesting they expect Darren Waller to lead the team in overall targets and receiving production. And I also project it that way with 19% target share, 119 targets going Darren Waller's way. So starting at the top with him, I think he turns 119 team targets, which wouldn't be crazy for Waller. We've seen him go for 140 targets back in the past with the Raiders. I have him turning that into 80 catches, 1,000 yards, 8 touchdowns. All the reports are glowing about this guy, the mismatches he's creating. His rapport with Daniel Jones is on point. Daniel Jones talking about how much he loves him and how easy this guy is going to make his job on Sundays, given the mismatch nightmares you can create with Darren Waller. You, of course, need health, which we haven't seen for two years now with Darren Waller, but I love the idea that the coaches are talking about, we're going to be careful about the hits this guy takes. Do we really want to use him as a blocker right now when he's essentially an alpha studying Julio Jones and AJ Green tape? I expect him to be their alpha kind of in de facto wide receiver one here, Darren Waller. So that's a, a big season for a tight end. You don't typically do not see a thousand yards at the position, never mind 80 catches. So I imagine when these all things all shake out, you know, there'll be Travis Kelsey at the top. I think Darren Wall is going to threaten for a top four spot in my projections after everything is all said and done. In fact, I have him ranked below Dallas Goddard, but after statting them both out today, Waller had better numbers than uh, Dallas Goddard in there. So I might have to adjust my rankings to reflect that. Other than that, uh, even if, so again, the yards might be a big jump. I really wouldn't be shocked at all if he jumps to about 30 touchdowns though, given Isaiah Hodgins, great touchdown threat last year. Uh, ultimately, only played for about half the season with this team and emerged you know, on 8% target share, still led the team with nine and a half fantasy points per game. I think he can take it to another level with a, a full season there. Had himself a really nice run. Him and Richie James both did uh, to close out the year last year. But also Darius Slayton had himself a good year. You know, 31% of his games uh, were well inside that wide receiver two or higher range. He had you know, 14 or more points in right around half his games last year. So Slayton, despite being a nobody to start the year, really picked it up as well. And then Richard James, you know, had a great season. So that's where I really get excited about him as a slot. Once he took over for Wandale, once Wandale got hurt from week 12 on, so week 11 to, to week 17, he was the wide receiver 12, Richie James, behind only T. Higgins, uh, Amari Cooper, Chris Godwin, Tyree Kill, Keenan Allen, CeeDee Lamb, Devonta uh, Smith, Amon Ross St. Brown, A.J. Brown, Devonta Adams, and Je Justin Jefferson. So all 11 of those guys you expect to be in your top 12. And then it's like Richie James on pace for 108 targets to close the year. Just want to reemphasize that slot role is so damn solid. But, but again, Isaiah Hodgins, once he really took over a starting role, wasn't for the last five weeks of the season. He averaged 15.2 PPR points per game, was a top 14 wide receiver in that span as well. So he has some good chemistry here. I just think it's a, a lot of weapons. And ultimately, they're all going to have their spike weeks. It's going to be tricky to project outside, again, of whoever that slot rolls. I think that's a nice, consistent weekly roll. But one week, Hodgins might spike for two touchdowns. And the next week, it's Slayton catching a 70-yard bomb down the sidelines. I don't know that in redraft, you'll consistently be able to rely 
on anyone outside of maybe Paris Campbell at the receiver position. But in best ball, I think all these guys are going to have some nice spikes. I really do like uh, ultimately stacking them up, as you can see, you know, 56, 8, 40, and 5 for Slayton, 7, 30, and 7 for Isaiah Hodgins, building off that really strong finish of last year. And then leading the way in receptions would be Paris Campbell, 72, 7, 900, uh, 792 yards and five touchdowns as well. Who knows if Wandell Robinson, Sterling Shepard, maybe they eat into that slot role and we just don't get a consistent guy right here. But as I project it now, it does look like Paris Campbell would be the lead there. And of course, Saquon then 68, 4, 42, and 3. That'd be right in line with what we always expect with him. Uh, so that's all the receiving work. And I know you question Daniel Jones getting to as many receiving yards as I say here. Which of these receivers, if any truth, was there anyone that you're like, I do not buy that argument in the least? I'm skeptical of all the receivers. I do like Waller a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and I, and I hear you projecting him over Goddard. And I think that um, if this receiving core is going to produce the way you're suggesting that they will, top, I mean, you know, I've never – you know, it's like they're like, oh, Paris Campbell's going to lead the receiver. I don't believe in Paris Campbell at all. I don't know. I mean, call me old fashioned, but I don't. Um, you know, I think that the receiving work would have to improve kind of, and this is not like a hot take or anything, uh, on the back of Daniel Jones taking his game to the next level and also Darren Waller and potentially Saquon just opening things up. I, I believe in both of those guys as talents, as great talents, even though Waller has uh, you know, underachieved at times. He's been incredible at times. Um, and I don't know, maybe one of these guys, maybe one of these receivers, you know, Wondell Robinson, let's not forget, he was the MVP at training camp last year. So, First know. round draft capital was drafted by this regime. So yeah, it, it might, and that, that's kind of where I'm getting. I think they just have a lot of solid guys and all of them will have their good moments throughout the season. If one man gets hurt, they have the depth now to step somebody up in between them. But yeah, I, I'm well, with you in terms of the only fair. real consistent guys here, probably Waller, probably Saquon. And I love both of those guys. And, and, and Daniel Jones. I do think Daniel Jones, I mean, we, look, he proved it at the end of last year. He's, you know, he, he can produce fantasy wise. He absolutely can. Um, we'll see. I, I do hear what you're saying as far. I mean, I, I'm not touching any of those receivers in like a, in like just a standard draft best ball. I could see the potential there. Um, you know, you have a lot more kind of margin for error in a best ball situation. And so I, I could see taking a, a guy or two from that list under those yeah. conditions, but I, I don't, I don't have faith in any of these guys to consistently produce maybe one or more of them will prove me wrong. It certainly happened before. Yeah. I, I'm with you too. And that's kind of the whole point with all these guys is I don't, I'm, I'm with you. I do love that. You can take Daniel Jones round 10 and then any of those guys I listed, whether it's Campbell, Hodgins, Slayton, Pick your choice, whoever you think is going to be the best. Pick your two of top two of the three, even Juan Dale Robinson. Toss him in the list. All those guys go round 16 or later. So you can really get that late stack like Daniel Jones and then have a couple of his weapons. So when Daniel Jones and those guys spike together, bam, they're both in your lineup and you don't have to worry about it uh, consistency-wise. But, yes, I, I don't think I'm going to rely on these guys very heavily if at all, in redrafts, other than maybe like a waiver wire, bye week fill-in type of guy. But yeah, you did mention Daniel Jones, the consistency. I didn't even say this on this pod, but anybody that listened to the top 20 uh, quarterbacks, you've heard this one many times. I've, I've tried to talk about him. Quarterback nine on the season, quarterback six from week seven on, when they really finally let him take off, had three 30-plus days within that 10-week span. He had, you know, seven of those 10 weeks or 20 points or above. He really did get it together and uh, as Brian Dable had his faith in him. So all these projections, all these big spikes are kind of just saying what happened from week seven on is only going to be augmented by the fact they have even better talent here now and Brian Dable is really going to let loose. I I'm betting on it big with that huge spike, and I do think I'm going to take it down the overall volume from 624, maybe to like 590 range, and we'll see a trickle-down effect. Uh, why don't I do that now? Let's just see what kind of that looks like because even 590 pass attempts would be like a 50 uh, big jump. So let me, let me just do this volume wise and see what that does for Daniel Jones's stats at the end of, at the end of everything. Cause I think that might be a little bit more believable. Uh, 4,332, even still, that's still a huge jump uh, for him, but it does feel a little bit better. Uh, and all these receiver numbers seem to look a little bit better. So I'm just going to save that. I think that is, fair with the other one being like this is the ceiling if Dayball 
really, really unleashes this thing. But I shouldn't be projecting for ceiling, even if I believe in it and I'm buying it myself. I should project for what's more so the median. This feels a little bit better. What do, what do you think of that? Yeah, I agree. And I, and I agree with your with your um, you know, reasoning there, too. I agree. You shouldn't be projecting ceiling uh, just in general, in my opinion. Um but you know, like you know, maybe maybe yeah, you're saying everything breaks his way. Maybe we could see a season like the one that you had up there before. Watch him come out and throw for like 5,200 yards or something. Make me look like an asshole. Right. right. He triples it up. He throws the NFL record. Get like first guy to get to six k. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. And then it'll be on. All right. So yeah, we're, we're like, right, about those we're giants, gonna, so clearly, we're like, we're gonna I'm hustle. We're gonna hustle through these, and then we do 21 minutes on the Giants. Yeah. <laughs> It's like I said though, it's one of my favorite offenses in the in the league. So I really wanted to dive in deep. But what is up, you fantasy wolf? Thanks so much for tuning in. If you haven't already, share your thoughts in the comments, check out some more videos, and join the newest Wolfpack by subscribing below.